You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda, and welcome to episode 228 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. Today, I have a crazy town story for you about sticky trails and the summer of independence. But first, I need a shot of bourbon. Cheers, y'all. So here's some fun news about our home. We have rats. Oh yeah, we do. Not in the house, mind you. They live in the alleyway where our garbage bins are stored. But sometimes after dark, they like to come out and rustle around in the leaves in the courtyard. I've named them Abelard and Eloise. And I have to admit, I occasionally fantasize about making them tiny little shirts and hats and having them sweep the balcony for us. My guy is so not pleased about any of this. He has the crazy notion that the rats are going to lunge for his throat one day and steal his wallet. He wants to call our landlord and have him put more traps out, and I think this is kind of an overreaction. In the grand circle of life, These rats control the palmetto bug population. And if you ask me, these are a far more insidious and terrifying pest. Besides, there are worse things to be sharing your home with than rats. Now that we're starting to settle in and we have furniture and bedding and all of those good things, we're beginning to extend invitations to our friends and family to visit us here. My guy is a little more liberal with his invitations than I prefer. I mean, I get tushy when I have to share a bar top, and that's a public space. So to have people in my home, even if they are friends and family, well, let's just say that makes me a little twitchy. And that's not just because I'm a misanthropic asshole. No. I do have some experience with house guests that's made me, well, exceedingly wary. Because, like I said, there are worse things to have than rats. I learned this shitty lesson very early on. During the summer, I had my college internship with the Spangoolie Show. Rather than make the two-hour commute from the cornfields to the city twice a day, I decided to cash in a bunch of bonds my grandmother had given me when I was a kid. And instead, I took a three-month lease on a furnished apartment in the city. That summer was my very first taste of independence, and oh my god, y'all, I loved it. I was experiencing it a little bit later than most of my friends. I mean, they'd all gone out of state for school and had been living in the dorms since their freshman year. Me, I opted to live at home. Which made sense, really. My college was only a few blocks away from my parents' house. So I just decided to save the money for something just like this. The apartment I found was in a high-rise on Michigan Avenue, just a block or two away from the Art Institute. It was a studio on the 27th floor, essentially a glorified hotel room designed for executives on extended stays in the city. There was a separate kitchen with a dining table, a narrow hallway leading to the bathroom, and a living area with enough room for a bed, a love seat, and the dresser where I propped my ridiculously large boombox. It was all the space that a girl like me could need. Most of my time was spent at the Spinguli studio anyway where I was learning the fine art of coiling cables and chucking rubber chickens. At night, I would eat ramen and stare out the window at the cityscape feeling very, very grown up. As if this is what being a grown up is about. And I suppose it was, in its own ways. I mean, even if I wasn't getting paid for it, I was working eight hours a day, and I was living off a very tight budget that I'd set for myself. The only person I had to answer to was... Me, and isn't that half the challenge of adulting? So, of course, it only makes sense that I would celebrate by throwing a party. And there was one name at the top of the guest list my girlfriend, Crazy Town. We hadn't gotten to the let's be strippers together phase of our friendship quite yet, so things between us were still good. Insane, but good. Because being friends with Crazy Town meant not just accepting, but welcoming an unnatural amount of crass chaos into my life. That chick was a force. 
one that I both loved and hated equally. Even so, I couldn't not invite her to the party. She was an important part of my life. And I wanted, I mean, hell, I needed to have her there to celebrate this gigantic summer of independence. And amazingly, Crazy Town showed up early for the party. Two days early, to be specific. I was at the TV studio when she arrived, and I would never have known that she was there at all if she hadn't badgered the building security into calling me at work. The poor guy sounded genuinely sorry and a little afraid as he asks me what he should do with Crazy Town. I kind of got the impression that he was hoping my answer would be, call the cops. And who knows, maybe it should have been. But me, I was just so eager to get the weekend started that Crazy Town's early arrival seemed like a good thing. So I said, hey, let her in. Tell her to make herself at home. Which is exactly what she did. Maybe two hours passed between her arrival and my getting home from the TV studio. And in that time, she had managed to pull half of my CDs out of their cases, drink all my Diet Coke, and glue a blow pop to the top of the dresser. It's funny. To this day, I cannot see a blow pop without thinking about Crazy Town. She always had a stash of them, either in the glove compartment of her car or in her purse. And every time she would offer me one, she'd say, take it, you know, for practice. Of course, she was as committed to the blow pops as she was the guys that she saw. And she often left a trail of both behind her, just half eaten and sticky. But I hugged her anyway when I came in, and I asked what brought her out so early. Crazy Town claimed to be there to help with preparations for the party, but I knew better. I took one look at her two beach bags stuffed to the brim with bikinis and trashy sundresses, and I knew full well that she just wanted easy access to the city, and my place made for a good crash pad. And I was mostly fine with that. I mean, what good is having an apartment in the middle of Chicago if you can't let a good friend like Crazy Town take advantage every once in a while? And to be fair, she really did help me get everything together for the party. While I spent Friday at the studio, she went shopping for essentials, you know, picking up booze and ice and snacks and condoms. She even cleaned the place up a little bit. Not that there was really all that much space to clean. All I had to do when I got home that night was get dressed. My friend had actually been helpful. (laughs) As we crammed together in front of the mirror to fix our hair, I couldn't resist giving her a little squeeze. I was so excited. This would be the first party that I had ever thrown in my very own apartment on a gorgeous summer night in Chicago. I had my best friend with me. I was feeling good. I mean, there was so much potential in the air that you could just feel it crackling around us. And you know, the one thing I will say about Crazy Town is that she always understood my moments. So she squeezes me back and she fluffs my hair away from my face and she says, this is your night, girly. I am beaming just full of the confidence that only a 21-year-old can experience when she's standing on top of the world. Well, at least the 27th floor of it. The door buzzer rings then, announcing the first of my guests, and within minutes, my party is on. Now, these were my friends, not Crazy Towns, which meant we played hostess to a very wacky assortment of musicians, intellectuals, A few stray actors I'd made friends with at the TV studio. And no one quite knew what to make of each other. Which meant I kind of start to panic when the first 20 minutes of my party had all the makings of a cotillion. Fortunately, booze makes a liberating common denominator. So between the jello shots and Crazy Town's irresistible charm, it wasn't long before everyone was getting along just fine. This, y'all, was the party that I had wanted to have since junior high, when I was lucky if I could scrape together maybe two or three people for my birthday. But this night, there was dancing, conversation, 
playful makeouts in the bathroom. It was everything that a successful party should be. And then, around midnight, we all sneak out onto the roof, where there's a pool and a sun deck. Neither were technically open, but hey, if they didn't want people in there, they should have locked it up better. And Crazy Town just shrieks when she sees the pool, as if she has never been so happy. And of course, she is the one who immediately starts taking her clothing off. She's the first naked body in the pool. And although a few people said their goodbyes at that point, well, there were several others, including me, who just follow suit. The rest of the night is a pleasant blur, faded both by time and the tremendous amount of booze we all drank. What I do remember is waking up in my apartment wrapped in a beach towel and feeling fucking fierce. Even the best parties eventually come to an end, y'all. And unfortunately, this is where my real story starts. I am so dehydrated, I have to prop my eyes open with my fingers. And when my vision clears, I see that I'm not alone. One of my random actor friends and his date are naked in bed with me. Crazy Town is curled up in a ball by our feet. And a musician, whom I'll call Smokey, is either sleeping or dead on the floor by the couch. A trail of crushed cheese balls circles the bed and leads to the apartment door. Somehow, I had the foresight to put a bottle of Gatorade next to the bed, and I gratefully grab it and take a very healthy swig. The neon green liquid wasn't quite as refreshing as I had hoped, seeing as how it had been doctored with an obscene amount of what I can only hope was vodka. I wrench myself from the sweaty tangle of unfamiliar limbs to make a mad dash to the bathroom, where I am forced to question just how adult any of this is as I am yakking into the toilet. Crazy Town must have heard me, because she knocks on the bathroom door before letting herself in. She wets a washcloth and puts it on the back of my neck when I come up for air, and she says, what you need is a shower. And then we can all go out to breakfast. I cannot believe how cavalier she is being. I mean, not counting us. There are three naked people in my apartment, only one of whom I genuinely know. And just how well I got to know the other two people last night is a mystery I'm not sure I want to figure out. And then there is Crazy Town, who has just slipped on my t-shirt and my panties and is casually brushing her hair without the slightest trace of awkwardness. She has managed to wake up looking just hot as ever, which I kind of hate her for in the moment. My own hair is matted to my face, there is a hickey on my neck, and my skin reeks of pool chlorine and cheese dust. The only thing I can do is start the water for a shower, hoping by the time that I am done, my head and my house will be clear. No such luck. Crazy Town has made everyone coffee, and she is trying to talk them all into a field trip to Oak Street Beach. The actor and his chick, who have thankfully put their clothing on, they decline and say that they need to be on their way. So I show them to the door, probably way too quickly to be polite, but whatever. And then I turn my attention to Crazy Town and Smokey, who are now sharing the love seat and seem in no hurry to move. Oh, y'all, I am so not in the mood for company. My head hurts, I'm still feeling kind of pukey. What I want is to have my bed to myself and stay there until Monday. But I'm an adult now, and I decide to suck my discomfort up. It's not like my parents were going to be coming home or anything, and, you know, why not let Crazy Town and Smokey hang out for a little while? It's not like my parents were about to come home or anything like that. Why not? Besides, I hadn't seen Smokey in a long time. Quite honestly, I was surprised he made it to the party at all, seeing as how he lived in Wisconsin. He played guitar in a very mediocre bar band that I discovered back when I was in high school. The band had been nice about sneaking me into their Chicago shows when I was underage, and Smokey and I had struck up a friendship over the years. Like most of my friendships, it was maintained over the phone. Back then, the phone was my social media. 
Smokey and I would talk maybe once or twice a week, you know, keep each other up to date with what we were up to, and we'd feel connected. And that is the insidious and deceptive intimacy of having a relationship, casual or otherwise, over a device. You start to believe you know the person. And let me just put this out here right now. You don't know shit. I don't care how many hours you spend talking to someone over video, via text, over the phone. You will never know that person for who they are until you spend time together in person. And even then, it's a crapshoot. Like with Smokey. Oh, sure, I'd spent a few hours with him at gigs over the years. I knew his bandmates. Hell, I'd met his mother at a gig once. But I could never have really known that the phone number I used to call him all those times was actually for a payphone. A payphone located in the rec room of the halfway house he'd been living at since getting out of prison. (laughs) You do not know the horror of realizing you are now sharing your home with an ex-convict. I heard this delightful little gem one week after my party had ended. It was over a ramen noodle dinner that I was sharing with Smokey and Crazy Town from the bed of my apartment. Somehow, hanging out that Saturday had turned into staying over, and staying over had morphed into staying on, and the next thing I knew, I was officially stuck with two house guests who showed zero intentions of ever leaving. I had expected this from Crazy Town, but Smokey was a surprise, as was his response when I asked him, hey, shouldn't you be getting back to Wisconsin sometime soon? This was my subtle way of saying, please get the hell out of my house, without putting it in so many words. I'd never been in the position of needing to kick someone out simply because I didn't want them there. As a kid, it's easy. There are countless parent-based excuses that you can give that people just accept. But now, taking a stand in my own home, it made me feel exceedingly uncomfortable. I mean, I didn't want to hurt the guy's feelings or make him mad. I just wanted him to leave, and I lacked any balls to say it. But Smokey didn't get the clue. Instead, he decides now is the time to open up to me and his new friend Crazy Town, about his troubled past. He tells us he's ready to move on from Wisconsin, where he's tired of playing by the rules of his halfway house. Chicago suits him just fine, he says. And he gives Crazy Town a greasy wink when he says this. And I realize, with just utter contempt and disgust, that son of a bitch the two of them have hooked up. Well, no wonder he doesn't want to leave, God damn it! No guy ever wanted to leave Crazy Town. Of course, he has no money, no job, and now no man to speak of. What he does have is one set of instructions on what to do if anyone calls the place looking for him. Crazy Town catches my eye when he says, and maybe you guys shouldn't answer the door either. And I see that even she is surprised by his news. She corners me in the kitchen while the guy is showering and asks me what the hell I thought I was doing inviting a convict to the party. Which kind of pisses me off. So I say, gee, I don't know. What the fuck were you doing sleeping with an ex-convict? We glare at each other for several minutes before we have to concede defeat. Clearly, we are both idiots. So I ask her, well, what the fuck do we do now? She wants me to kick him out, and I want her to break things off with him. And both of us are too scared to do either. You see, the thing is, he never did tell us why he landed in jail, and we didn't ask. So neither of us wants to, you know, anger the guy on the off chance that maybe he did something violent and murdery way back when, and, well, my possibly do it again. He emerges from the bathroom, naked, and gives us a little nod as he drops his wet body down onto the bed. 
Crazy Town leans in and whispers, Don't worry, I'll think of something. And then she turns and runs into the studio to take a flying leap onto the bed, tackling Smokey and giggling as if everything is just fine. So not fine. For the next several days, I spend as much time as I possibly can at the TV studio, staying late for shoots and edit sessions that union rules prevent me from doing anything other than just watching. But I don't care, because the studio is my only respite from the horror show that my little summer home has become. Crazy Town and Smokey have started having sex so frequently that they've just stopped wearing clothing altogether. And when they're not fucking, they're eating. My pathetic little window air conditioner is running constantly, but it does little to combat the stench of cum and two weeks worth of dirty dishes. Smokey refuses to leave the apartment at night. He is convinced that someone, he won't say who, is out there looking for him. So he just sits up all night, strumming his cheap guitar and writing love songs for Crazy Town. I'll tell you, if I hadn't paid my three-month lease in advance, I would have just skipped town while they were sleeping. But stubbornness, fear, and, well, probably stupidity keep me chained to a situation that is rapidly spinning out of my control. And just when I think it can't get any worse, I come home and I find Crazy Town and a cat waiting for me. A cat! Well, at least I think it's a cat. The creature was pacing back and forth in front of my bed when I walked in. It had one orange eye glaring at me before the thing tears into the kitchen and leaps to the top of the refrigerator. And Crazy Town, she's right behind it, grinning in her deranged way and looking way too pleased with herself. And she says, I got it! I'm pretty sure the only thing Crazy Town has right then is rabies. She motions to her four-legged fiend, which is now drooling and hissing at us from its perch, and says that this little so-called cat is our ticket to freedom. I say, sweetheart, I want to empty this fucking menagerie, not add to it. But she explains. It would seem that in between banging Smokey Senseless, she's been gathering intel. And my makeshift Matahari has learned that Smokey is painfully allergic to cats. I'm skeptical. She has completely bewitched this dummy, and she thinks a cat is going to break the spell? I don't think so. But she will not be swayed. She says, I'm training it to use his duffel bag as a litter box. So I follow her toward the closet, where I see that the cat has indeed crapped in his bag. But the bag is not filled with kitty litter. It's filled with sand. <laughs> it's here where I have to look at my friend and ask her something that I really don't want to know the answer to. Because if Crazy Town couldn't be bothered to buy cat litter, then just where the fuck did she find the cat? <laughs> I just have this horrible vision in my head of Crazy Town prowling around the alleys of Chicago and going, here, kitty, kitty. <laughs> talking this feline, you know, under her arm <laughs> and just walking right into the apartment. Y'all, I'm sorry. I wish I could accurately describe what Crazy Town looks like then because her ha she has blonde hair and it is wild and her eyes are just glowing. And I swear to God, she looks like the cat. And as I'm sitting here pondering all of this, the cat yowls. And with its mouth open like that, I'm a little relieved to see that the thing is missing some teeth all the fewer to bite us with, I guess. And although it is indeed missing one eye, you can tell this cat has seen some shit. But then it stretches, and it drops like a kamikaze from the fridge right onto Crazy Town's shoulders. Apparently the two of them have bonded. And I suppose I really shouldn't have been surprised. I mean, really, there's not much difference between Crazy Town and a feral cat. One just has sharper claws than the other. Smokey walks in there, 
He'd been on the rooftop getting sun and drinking me out of booze. And he stops dead when he sees Crazy Town snuggling with her mangy friend. He's all, what the fuck is that? And in response, the cat takes a swipe at him, easily connecting with his cheek and leaving a trio of red welts. Crazy Town looks at me and she says, well, Juliet, you want to tell Smokey what this is? I can't help but appreciate that she has left the final decision up to me because that's not something she normally does. Although there really is no question about what I have to do here. I scratch the cat's crooked little head and I say, well, Smokey, this is Crazy Town's cat. His name is Kalamazoo and he'll be staying with us. The name Kalamazoo just kind of slipped out. I didn't even really think about it. It was just the remnant of a memory I had of an old country song. But it fit. Oh, did it ever fit. Kalamazoo and Crazy Town made a hell of a pair. And there was no getting between the two of them. Not even for me. Kalamazoo may have tolerated my presence, likely knowing in its own inherent way that I was the source of its food, but man, did that thing hate Smokey. Even after we got it a proper litter box, it still used Smokey's duffel bag. And every time he would reach for Crazy Town in the hope of maybe having sex, Kalamazoo would sink his teeth into whatever part of Smokey happened to be closest. Smokey wound up erupting in a violent case of hives that not even all the Benadryl in the world could tame. He finally got so disgusted and fed up with the situation that he gave Crazy Town an ultimatum. Choose him or the cat. Clearly, not a hard choice to make. Convict or cat? Clearly, you choose the cat. I silently hand Smokey a garbage bag to pack up his few belongings, seeing as how his duffel bag was no good to him anymore. He's too pissed off to say much to either of us, but he does deliver a final fuck you to the cat before slamming the door behind him. Kalamazoo, like any good cat, was too busy licking its own ass to care. The relief at seeing Smokey gone is so immense that it gives me the courage I need to take care of one more thing. Actually, two things. Crazy Town is jumping up and down and saying, we did it, he's gone. And I have to grab hold of her hands and kind of pull her down to sit next to me on the bed. And I say, girly, tomorrow you and Kalamazoo need to pack up and head on out too. I didn't want to say it, I didn't, but I had to. And her expression shifts, first from surprise and then to hurt. And I get it. I mean, this is the first time I have ever taken a stand with Crazy Town. I mean, sure, I've said no to her. You know, I've, I've <laughs> declined to participate in some of her more deadly plans. And I've definitely been mad at her. But I've never told Crazy Town to just go home. And it wasn't that I didn't want to be with her ever. I just wanted to have my space back. I wanted to experience my summer on my own terms and maybe start to figure out this whole adulting thing. And that was something I definitely needed to do by myself. And to her credit, she understood. Crazy Town somehow always understood my moments. So she moves out the next day while I'm at the studio, but she did leave me two parting presents. The first was a pile of blow pops and a note telling me to remember to practice. The second was an infestation of fleas. <laughs> That's my girl crazy town. As a side note, y'all, you should know that crazy town kept Kalamazoo the cat. She took him to the vet and got him all cleaned up and defleed. And I have to admit that to this day, I am glad she had that wonky little one-eyed trash cat to ride shotgun to her crazy when I couldn't. Cheers, y'all. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. Be sure to join me on Monday nights on YouTube, y'all. I do a show called Bourbon Soaked Live, and it is a great way to hang out and have conversation and cocktails with a bunch of cool people. The show starts at 7 p.m. Central Time, and that's 8 p.m. Eastern Time for those of y'all who can't do math, and it is a great time. Just look for Juliet Miranda on YouTube. You'll find me.
And go to theunwritablerant.com if you want to catch up on back episodes of this podcast. I hope you all have a great week. I'll be back next Sunday to share some more bourbon-soaked stories with you. Cheers. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon, a couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. It is all the same, what you say, bon ton. Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a